Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 89, a stroppy professor's guide to theory. Oh, am I excited about this vlog and it comes via many requests from many students over the last six months. So a big hi to Roz, big hi to Andrew, Tiff, hello, Ben, Nat, so many of our students this is an important moment for them. And there is a reason why we're here today and why this is significant. Because understandings of theory are undercooked in research training at the moment. All the attention is on the research proposal, research questions, method and methodology, and theory is sort of left out in the car park. Now I've noticed this is particularly a problem in the last couple of years or so, when students come and see me and they talk about their theory chapter. Theory chapter. And I look at them and say, right, well, theory chapter, if you've got a theory chapter, what is the rest of your thesis? Fact. Now, the problem with configuring your thesis in that way is you start to de deploy the theory that dare not speak its name. So if you're saying, I'm empirical, there's my theory chapter and the rest of it is empirically driven, you have to be careful because the theory that dares not speak its name is empiricism. And the last thing this planet needs right now is empiricism. So theory is being badly handled in theses at the moment and every single thesis I've examined in the last 10 years has seen a decline in theory like that in all disciplines that I examine but particularly any mention of post-structuralism, deconstruction or the truly appalling critical discourse analysis. Who knew? So theses that pretend they're doing those theories just appalling. Now I, the other reason I thought let's do the vlog right now is in the last couple of weeks I just examined a PhD and I gave it a C, a uh, major correction, because of theory. So this thesis investigated and deployed phenomenology. Phenomenology, okay, that's a body of theory, that's great, but it's a dated theory. It's a heavily critiqued theory. So if you're going to summon phenomenology, you need to explain why you've done that and like the 50, 60 years of staunch critiques of that model. But instead what happened was this student used phenomenology, used theory in an evangelical way, like there was simply no alternative. And that's a problem we are seeing not only when we're particularly seeing phenomenology in theses, but a whole series of quite odd splinter groups of theories where supervisors simply you know, share their religious evangelical commitment for one particular theory and of course that hurts the student because students need that flexibility of mind. So always remember that there are many theories and there are many, many ways of knowing and it is your responsibility, yes you, your responsibility to present that theoretical perspective and also present the alternatives to it, to present the critiques to it. Why have you made that selection? And this really matters because I, I judge. I judge scholars by the caliber of their theory because what the best theorists have is a flexibility of the mind, a dynamism of the mind, a capacity to present a particular perspective and also, also the alternatives and the options that are available to that theoretical perspective. So yes, it is time to put in my stroppy guide to theory. And yes, look, I am a very calm person, but can I say the state of what I'm seeing in theory and theoretical analysis on the planet at the moment is just making me foam at the mouth. So I'll, I'll try and stay really calm, but I might fail a little bit during this vlog, for which I apologise. So let's start with some definitions. What is theory? Theories are assumptions that create a rational explanation for relationships between ideas or phenomena. Theories explain the frame and the shape of your ontology. Now this is where it gets significant, the etymology of the word theory. The word theory comes from the ancient Greek theoria. Now this is really significant, theoria, which means beholding or spectator or viewing. So there is an idea and theory spectates, looks at that idea. Notice the gap or the space between the object and the theory. 
There is a space there. That's important. So in other words, the determination of any fact is configured through your theory, your perspective, your view of it. So a theory is an explanation about how an object, experiment or idea operates. And for a lot of academics, theories are also bodies of knowledge. So the word theory varies enormously in how it's deployed between all the disciplines. So in the harder sciences, we seem to see theory as an explanation for a pattern or a series of events. And therefore, the theory within the harder sciences fits into scientific method. But so often, and it does vary, in the harder sciences, we see theory as descriptive. In the humanities, it is prescriptive. And as always in the social sciences, it's somewhere in between. So for the sciences, hypothesis, theory and law have very distinct meanings. But in the humanities, theories also have very, very clear and precise definitions and applications. But what I think all the disciplines share, and it's a great thing, is this dispassionate notion of theory. So I am a theorist, I am separated from what is going on, what I'm viewing. And that dispassionate connotation of theory comes from Pythagoras. Pythagoras argued that theories are uninvolved. Theories are unemotional. It was Aristotle, sadly, who separated theory and practice thinking and doing. And that's a really problematic binary opposition and so many paradigms, so practice-led research in particular, is really troubled by that Aristotle binary opposition. Because basically there is no practice without a theory of practice and thinking in and of itself is a form of doing. So the separation between theory and practice is just simply nonsense. Two examples I think best show this flaw, so I'll just quickly throw them out there. You want to see how theory creates doing? Well, Marxist theory creates revolutions, <laughs> and feminist theory creates social movements for change. So there is no separation between theory and practice. So what is the point of theory? Theories, if you will, are analytical tools that help us to explain an object, a subject, or an idea in a considered, rational, and also predictable fashion. At their best, theories have explanatory power, and they explain the relationships between concepts. That's great theory. Theories allow us, as researchers, to identify and isolate a problem and also to develop strategies to manage and solve that problem. There are three types of theories, and this is a generalisation, but I'll put it out there. The speculative theories that attempt to explain what is happening. The descriptive theories, no surprise here, which attempt to describe what is happening. And the constructive theories, these are interesting. This is where we're dealing with a revision of older theories to create a new way of thinking. So theory is complex knowledge. It's intricate knowledge. So what I'm looking for in a student, when I take on a student as a supervisor, or I'm examining a thesis, is can a scholar manage the big ideas. So theory, for me, is a proxy for intelligence, to be frank with you. If a student can manage the big ideas and the big theories, then I know this is a bright person. So a scholar who is a fine theorist has a dynamism of the mind. So what can theory do for you, yes you, as a PhD student and as a researcher? Well, if you present your theoretical assumptions clearly, then your readers, your examiners, can evaluate your capacity to make an argument. So your theoretical framework demonstrates the relationship between your current study and existing knowledge. So if you're trying to make an original contribution to knowledge, which is the definition of a PhD, you need a theory because the theory is what connects what existed in the past and what you are doing right now. 
Your theory can also justify the selection of methods, that's methodology, and your theory can also configure the limitations of your study, so what you are not talking about, crucial in a PhD. So your theories can also demonstrate the limitations of generalisations, the limitations in already existing knowledge. Really great stuff. So whenever you become a bit lost, like what's a theory? What am I doing here again? Always remember the theories are the why questions, not the what, not the how, the why. So why did the concrete crack? Why is that water source polluted? Why did the First World War start? What caused the global financial crisis? And of course, why Donald Trump? So theory is a believable explanation. So the answer to the question, why Donald Trump, is not God. Not God, trust me, really not God. What a theory gives you in an answer to a question like why Donald Trump is an explanation that is believable to a community. Now that may be a community of scholars, a community of stakeholders, or indeed citizens. So let's answer that question, why Donald Trump? What do we need theoretically to answer that question? Okay, we require an understanding of rural voting patterns in the United States. We need to understand and put together theories of a decline in manufacturing in the Rust Belt cities, the second tier cities of the United States. And we also have to have a theory of Hillary Clinton as a female candidate and specific challenges she confronted as a woman cutting through that particular election. So they're the theories we need to start making sense of why Donald Trump. So theories allow us as researchers to position ourselves in the world and also position ourselves in terms of our perspective on the world. And we do need to commit to theory because theory and theorists do matter a lot. And since I returned to Australia, and it's almost the fifth anniversary since I returned to Australia this week actually, very interesting to return home, but I remember being uh, at Manchester Airport on the flight, <coughs> excuse me, coming back to Australia and I made a promise to myself that I would commit to theory and upon my return to Australia I would not apologise for the theory that I do. Before I left Australia, theorists were seen to be sort of second or third-rate scholars that no one was interested in. And I was always apologising for doing theory. Upon my return, I promised myself I would never do that again, and I never have. And I think part of the problem we have in this field is the use of the word only. You're only a theorist. You're only a theorist. And of course, that comes back to the Aristotle problem we talked about earlier. Now, first here, somebody who's been a media practitioner for over two decades, by any definition of how you're doing theory and practice, it's simply not accurate. But there is nothing only about theory. Think about the climate change deniers at the moment. What phrasing are they using to justify their argument? That climate change is only a theory. Mm -hmm. Theories are important because they can figure relationships between objects and relationships between ideas. Theories demonstrate that a scholar understands an argument, yes, but also how to construct an argument, the meta, and how that argument becomes a framework for meaning. Theories have power social power and political power. Now, Steve Redhead's book, which I've got the cover here, um, and of course Steve, I'm married to Steve, but Steve's book, Theoretical Times, has just been published. In fact, it was published on Friday. Theoretical Times, sold incredibly well, thank God. But this book is important, I think, because it commits to really big ideas. It commits to big concepts, big ideas in difficult times. And this book argues that in a time of Kardashians and reality television, we also have celebrity theorists like Zizek, like Badieu, like Baudrillard, who are offering really tough, 
gritty, gutsy interpretations of our difficult times. Now, in anti-intellectual times, thankfully, we have high theory and we have high theorists to offer an alternative explanation. And I want to finish off this vlog today with a wonderful statement from a great scholar on this planet, Professor Simon Winlow. Simon, much respect. You are a great scholar, sir. And Simon, in his review of Theoretical Times, offered, I think, the best paragraph that anybody has written in the 2010s. This is powerful work. This is inspirational work for me. I read this quote every morning before I start work. And Simon stated, quote, Now is the time for high theory. Now is the time to dispense with dour empiricism and recommit to creative, ambitious and imaginative intellectualism. More and more students are waking up to the institutionalised blandness of the social sciences and seeking out the work of new generations of theorists who offer startling accounts of the economy, culture and politics, who dare to imagine what the future may hold. End of quote. Dare to imagine what the future may hold. So whenever you're thinking, what's the point of theory? Why am I doing this? Why do people care about theory? Just remember that last line from Simon Winlow. We as scholars, if we are courageous, dare to imagine what the future may hold. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why theory matters. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.